So uh, as you sit down, I will introduce our um, second tutorial speaker, uh, Johannes uh, Kellendonk. Um, he will be talking um, mathematics, but uh, like many of the mathematicians that uh, work with us, uh, he also got his PhD in physics in Bonn, the same place as uh, Michael and Uwe, uh, roughly at the same time or a little later. Um, he uh, then, uh, so this was in 1993, then he spent a uh, postdoc at King's College in uh, London. Uh, then he spent uh, another postdoc at the Technical University of Berlin. Um, then he became faculty at Cardiff University um, in the UK, and since 2003, he is in France and in in beyond at the university. Um, he'll be talking about topology and specifically about topological quantum numbers and quasi-crystals and quasi-periodic tilings. Um, he mentions specifically that uh, he has been working a lot on non-commutative topology in physical systems. This will be related to the talk, and I hope he will explain uh, what that means to all of us. Um, and he's responsible uh, for the definition of C-star algebras that are associated with the tilings that we all uh, work with and love. So he's going to explain all that to us, the C-star algebras and the commutative topology. No, he's doing no. But he'll give us the basic background so we can start understanding these notions. So please, Johannes, thank you. I need the time. OK. Well, thank you very much for this nice introduction. <coughs> Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation. I was here already one week in this wonderful country for the first time. My title has two words in it which uh, recently deserved Nobel Prizes. Uh, so we have seen quasi crystals then Schechtmann, but also in topological quantum numbers there has been recently a Nobel Prize for uh, Thaules, Kostalitz, and uh, Haldane. So not so often you see these two coming together and I try to uh, explain a little bit where they can come together. Here's my overview. I will start with uh, something which you find in textbooks about condensed matter physics, namely Berry curvature, and lead you from there to K-theory and churn co-cycles. Then I will explain you what is K-theory using a physics language, namely the language of topological insulators and topological phases. And the third part, I would like to convince you that it is fruitful to look at K-theory because this will give you uh, relations between topological numbers. And then at the end, there will be applications to quasi-crystals. So you may all have seen what is Berry curvature, but let me remind you. Let's start with a Hamiltonian, which depends on a parameter eta. So eta is a parameter sitting in a smooth manifold, and I let this now depend in time. So the Hamiltonian depends on time through a parameter, however, only very slowly. So my dependence of eta and time will be much, much slower than the typical time scale, which I will have, I look at the electronic problem, that means the Schrodinger equation, for the Hamiltonian. To solve this system, usually you start by just neglecting the time dependence in my parameter, and so you have a time independent Hamiltonian, and the Schrodinger equation is just an eigenvalue equation. It has a solution, which is the linear uh, superposition of eigenfunctions, and all these eigenfunctions, they are actually quite simple, right? So I have a number, let's say this is the n's eigenfunction, times a, a phase which rotates rather fast, and I'm not very much interested in this uh, rotating phase, this fast rotating phase. I will be more interested in what happens to the first, to phi n of eta. So that's the starting point. 
Now, in a second uh, approach, you want to, to solve the full time dependent solution. However, in, a, in the adiabatic approximation, which tells you that actually the dependence of eta on time is so weak that this matrix element here, that this matrix element is just very small. And moreover, and that's important, the eigenvalue I'm considering, the n's eigenvalue which I'm following, shall, shall, shall remain isolated during the time evolution of eta. Now, if you do this, then the correction to the stationary solution is just given by a phase, and this phase can be computed using what's called the Berry potential. The Berry potential of the nth band, so An, is this matrix element here where you find this first uh, eigenfunction uh, and scalar product with the gradient of this eigenfunction, and the gradient is with, with respect to, to this extra parameter. Now note that this doesn't depend on time anymore, and actually time will not play a role here. It's only geometry which will play a role. And if you know a little bit about gauge theory, then you see that this is actually the connection of a gauge theory, because we know that uh, quantum mechanics in the Schrodinger picture is actually a gauge theory, it's a U1 gauge theory, because this uh, function phi n here can be determined only up to a phase by normalization. So, knowing a little bit about gauge theory, you know also that the only physical interesting uh, quantities, they should be gauge invariant, and so we will look rather at a quantity which is not just the uh, uh, Berry potential, but it's the Berry curvature. So what's the Berry curvature? The Berry curvature is the curl of the Berry potential. It's very much like in electromagnetic theory. Oh, actually, you can see the analogy between magnetic potential and a magnetic field. So why is this very interesting for us? Well, because this is sort of a, the prime source of what's called topological quantization, which is a quantization which is not like the standard quantization which you find in uh, quantum mechanics first year, if you wish, which comes from spectral theory, but it's a quantization which comes through topology, and it goes like this. Suppose that your parameter eta lives on a surface without boundary, in such a way that uh, for all values of this parameter, my assumptions are satisfied. The eigenvalue remains isolated. So that the Berry curvature is defined for this surface. Then if you integrate the Berry curvature over the surface, you get a number. And this number is an integer. And, and this is more important even for us, this number is stable under deformations of my Hamiltonian, which keeps the eigenvalue isolated. So that's the source of topological numbers. Let me give you an example. Suppose I look at a tight binding model on the lattice Z squared and I allow for certain internal degrees of freedom, spin degrees of freedom, so it's a tensor product with a C2. And I take a, an example which is not a very good example in some sense for a quasi-crystal conference, but it's still teaching us something. Suppose it's periodic. If it's periodic, I can do a Bloch uh, theory. I can do a Bloch transformation and can describe everything instead of being operators on little L2 of Z squared as being operators on the Brion zone. So I have a whole family of two by two matrices indexed by the quasi-momentum. And then I just give you this Hamiltonian. Here's the Hamiltonian. I give it to you in quasi-momentum space. It's very simple. It's, it's perhaps the most simple you can write down. It involves the Pauli matrices. Right. Now, uh, it's not very important how it exactly looks, 
but it's really a toy model in so far that you can calculate everything and you can determine the spectrum. You can see that it has uh, spectral bands, which are two bands, which are separated. If my parameter m, which may take real values, avoids the number minus two, zero, and two. And then you can calculate the very curvature of the first band, and you find different values depending on in which open interval you are. Now, mathematically, the fact that the churn number here, so this integral, is non-zero, tells us that we cannot define continuously an eigenfunction for the first band. So that's an example. So let me now go over to, if you wish, the Heisenberg picture. I sort of started in the Schrodinger picture and the Berry connection or the Berry potential was constructed from this uh, uh, solution of the eigenvalue equation. However, observe that if I look at the projection onto the nth eigenspace, here this is the projection onto the nth eigenspace, then this is already a gauge invariant quantity. And so it's no wonder that we can write the Berry connection, uh, the Berry curvature, uh, just from this projection, taking derivatives in the parameter space and the trace. And that brings me to my uh, uh, approach to the matter, namely that we are going to review this Berry curvature in operator algebraic language in a different way. We say actually it comes from projections and projections will define elements of the K0 group. And then I add traces and derivations and I get my topological numbers. So the, the, the topological quantization theorem will always be of the form I have a, an element of my K0 group. This will be coupled or paired, as I will say, with churn cocycles which will be made of traces and derivations. And then I get a number, and that's my topological number. And if you're a physicist, you can think of this here, the K group being a topological phase, and this here, the churn cycle, being a measurement of this topological phase to give me a number. So what would we gain if we take this approach? Well, the first thing we gain is that uh, everything is defined for operator algebras. I don't need any Brillon zone anymore. I don't have smooth manifolds. And so I can do everything also for quasi-crystals. Now, uh, this is nothing very new. It's actually Belisar's program of the C-star algebraic approach to solid-state physics, to aperiodic media. In some sense, Jean Bellissard liked to call this the non-commutative Brion zone. And the other thing which we gain, and which I would like to explain you in more detail, is that you can now use the algebraic topology of K-theory to relate different physical systems and then get equalities between topological numbers of different physical systems. And if time permits, I will show you two examples one which connects gap labeling to phase on motion, and the other which connects Bragg peaks to gap labels. So let me explain you what is K-theory. And I would say that physicists should have invented K-theory if they had looked at topological insulators early enough, because really K-theory is topological insulators. So a Hamiltonian with a gap, right? A Hamiltonian with a gap is an insulator. That's the standard picture. I look at the one particle approximation. I have the, in the back of my mind that my Fermi energy lies in the gap. And then I say that all the states below the gap are filled 
and the states above the gap, they are empty. And since I have a gap at low temperature, there's not enough energy to excite. So everything stays fixed, and therefore the direct conductivity would be zero. So we call simply a Hamiltonian with a gap an insulator. And it's convenient to shift the gap to zero for the mathematical theory. And then we want to make a theory of phases, which I defined by topology, of topological phases for insulators. And we say that two insulators, which means two gapped Hamiltonians, they are in the same topological phase if they can be deformed into each other without closing the gap. Which means mathematically that there should be a continuous path linking the first Hamiltonian to the second. However, if you want to be serious, talking about continuous path, you should talk about what is the topology, and you should talk about what is the background space. So I am advocating that the background space is a C-star algebra, and the topology is the norm of the C-star algebra, is the norm topology. And I will not explain exactly what a C-star algebra is, because you already know it in some sense, because you know B of H, all bounded operators on a Hilbert space. And now I can look inside B of H and look at subalgebras, and I want them to be closed under the norm. And that's a C-star algebra. It's a bit of a, an easy definition or an equivalent definition. Actually, any C-star algebra has a faithful representation as a norm-closed subalgebra of bounded operators on some Hilbert space. Now, the choice of the C-star algebra, I claim, is extremely important. And there are discussions about it. What is the right C-star algebra? And I think, especially for quasi-crystals, I would like to take the one which I'm going to describe. I will see that actually all the topology, and therefore the topological numbers which, which are going to be split out, they depend on the choice of this algebra. So what is now a topological phase? Let's look at this uh, set, a topological space set with topology, which I call it gapped self-adjoint of A, which contains all self-adjoint elements of my algebra, which have a gap at zero. So if you wish, contains all the insulators of A. And now, by what I said above, a topological phase is nothing else than a connected component of this set. So the mathematical theory turns around describing the connected components of this set. Now, there is a very natural operation of addition which a physicist would describe like this. Let's suppose we have an insulator, a two-dimensional insulator, and now I stack another insulator above it. So there are two layers of insulators. I don't let them interact for a while. What would be the corresponding Hamiltonian? Well, if the first insulator had H1 and the second H2, then I would say that now the Hamiltonian of the total system is their direct sum. And I can see this by looking at my Hilbert space as being something which is spatial, like a little L2 of Z squared, so describing uh, the points in space, and something which is internal, like the spin degrees of freedom, which is a Cn. And then this direct sum just enlarges the Hilbert space in such a way that only the fiber is doubled. So that's, that's the operation of stacking. The operation of stacking is direct sum. Given one insulator, I can always stack it with the trivial insulator. Now, for me, the trivial insulator is just the Hamiltonian which is equal to one. It's the identity operator because if the gap is at zero, then below the gap there are no states, so there's nothing. 
But above the gap, there is no states anyway, so there's nothing. So the operator one describes the vacuum. It's the trivial insulator. So I can stack my Hamiltonian with this trivial insulator, and the idea is now to say, okay, I'm putting all stacked Hamiltonians into one single space, and if it's only one layer, then I'm allowed to add trivial layers so that I can compare all the stacked insulators. So this gives me a huge, big topological space. It's the union of all n of gapped Hamiltonians. Well, now, not in A, but in the matrix algebra of A. So like this one is in N2. I'm allowing an n arbitrary high n. So this is now a huge beast, and its connected components are my topological phases. Saying that I speak about connected components means just I mod out homotopy. Homotopy just is another word for saying that two elements are identified if they are linked by a continuous path. And now the operation of stacking can be read on, on this space here as the operation of an abelian sum. It's an addition, and I get an abelian semigroup. Because if I take the homotopy class of a Hamiltonian plus, so here, in here I have homotopy classes of Hamiltonians. If I take the homotopy class of the direct sum H1 plus H2, uh, it's going to be the same than the homotopy class of H2, H1. So this is almost K0. To get K0, you just uh, look at formal differences. So it's just a way of turning a, an abelian semigroup into a group. I would say that this part is mathematical. It's to make some algebraic topology work. So what do we have? Well, I repeat, the K0 group is just the group of topological phases with stacking as addition. And the elements are homotopy, homotopy classes of gapped Hamiltonians. Now, if you look into the literature, in the, in the mathematical literature of K-theory, then you find that K0 is defined by projections. Well, this is the same thing because uh, I can look at the Fermi projection of my Hamiltonian which is the projection onto the states below the gap. And so I get a projection from a Hamiltonian. Or I can look at the projection and take the element 1 minus 2 times the projection. Then I get a gapped self-adjoint element. So this operation translates between the two. Again, everything depends on the algebra. And I should say, just taking all bounded operators on H does not work because the K theory of this is trivial. This would mean that there are no topological phases. So what is the algebra I'm going to looking at? I, I will look at the algebra which is made from something which I think is also very natural in physics from pattern equivariant functions. So, suppose that your material is described by a point set, namely the point set of its atomic positions of, or its ionic positions. Or, I prefer to write things as tilings because they are much easier to visualize. Right? So I could, for instance, think of my point set as being the vertices of a tiling. Then a pattern equivariant function will be a function which associates to each point a complex number in such a way that, well, if I want to know what is the value of the function at some point x and compare to the value of the function at some point y, and around x I see a local configuration which is the same as the local configuration about y, out to a distance r, then I want the values to be close, and the measure of closeness 
is given by the size, so by the distance r. So it's a bit of a wiggle definition. It's an epsilon delta definition, as you see often in analysis. I won't read it out. It's not very important. You can make it up yourself in some sense. But the, the prime examples would be functions which just look at the local configuration and then say, OK, this local configuration determines my, my value. I should say that there is also a continuous version of pattern equivariant functions where the functions are not defined for type binding model on a point set, but they would be defined on all of RD. Now, what are pattern equivariant operators? Before I had just functions, now I want operators, operators which define Hamiltonians. Well, let's look at a Hamiltonian acting on a Hilbert space little l2 of my point set. Tensor, uh, internal degrees of spin or freedom, whatever. Then I would write this equation in such a way that h applied to psi evaluated at a point x is given by such a sort of matrix multiplication, except that h x y must be a matrix because psi at x is just a, a vector in the internal space. It's in Cn. So looking at all these matrices, I want that I have something which you would call short range interaction, meaning that they go to zero if the distance between the legs x and y becomes infinite. And the second thing I want to do is that the function which associates to x and y this matrix element is pattern equivariant. And this now involves two legs, x and y. And so it's sort of the same definition as before, except that I have to look at the local no neighborhood of these two points. And I have to take care of the distance between the two. So this is a pattern equivariant operator. This algebra which I define here, the algebra of pattern equivariant operators, is really, to my mind, the good choice of algebra for aperiodic models. And if you have played around with aperiodic models, you take Hamiltonians which are in this algebra. So, I told you about topological phases being K-theory. I told you about the good algebra. I now have to tell you about the things which I used to measure the topological phases, the Chernko cycles. These are all of a very particular nature. They are given by a trace on the algebra. So I recall that a trace is a linear functional which is uh, cyclic, so it means that the trace of AB is equal to trace of BA. And also, I have derivations on the algebra and commuting derivations. A derivation is a linear map from A to A which satisfies the Leibniz rule. So that's the Leibniz rule. And finally, I need that these Derivations leave the trace invariant in the sense that the trace on a total derivation has to be zero. Once you have this, you can get numbers from homotopy classes of gapped Hamiltonians in this way. You take the Hamiltonian, you look at its Fermi projection, and then you apply the trace to P, and here the first derivation applied to P up to the nth derivation applied to P, except, and I'm sorry, I forgot to write it down, I put 1 and n into brackets, which I think is the standard notation in physics to say that I anti-symmetrize these indices. So this is a bit of shorthand for, for a sum over the permutation group of n elements and uh, 
then this permutation group would uh, permute these indices here and involve signs. So this is the famous comparing of a K0 element and a giant core cycle. Let me just show you what this does in our example. So I had this periodic example, which was only half allowed in this conference. And if you do this, well, you have the derivations with respect to quasi-momentum. And you have the two by two matrix trace, because you remember these are the Pauli matrices, so I need to go from matrices to numbers. And you have an integral over the Brion zone, and integrals, they are also traces. So the combination integral over the Brion zone with this two by two trace is a trace on the algebra. And this is an expression exactly as the one before where n is equal to two. Now, you don't have to use derivations in quasi-momentum, but you can rewrite this whole expression using only a trace and derivations on the algebra by, well, replacing the integral of the Brion zone, well, it is the trace per unit volume, and this uh, derivative with respect to quasi-momentum is nothing else than the commutator with the position operator. So the whole formula here, which seems to need a Brion zone, can be written without reference to a Brion zone, and so can be applied to any material which a periodic or not. Now I should say, since I want to make a connection to quasi-crystals, I should say that uh, uh, more interesting for quasi-crystals are other Chernko cycles, more simple Chernko cycles, Chernko cycles which are trivial in the periodic uh, case. Right? What happens if I don't take any derivation here? That's still a Chernko cycle. If I do it, then I just get the integral of the trace of the Fermi projection, and this is just one. So for, quasi, uh, for, 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 for periodic crystals, this is not interesting, but for quasi-crystals, it will be very interesting. Why? Well, because uh, of the gap labeling, which Jean Bellissat introduced in the 90s, which makes exactly use of this particular Chernko cycle. So how does this work? Well, remember L is the set of positions of the atoms. Remember, I consider the algebra of pattern equivariant functions over L. This is a very specific algebra. And on it, I look at the trace per unit volume. So I have this trace on this algebra. Now, given any gapped Hamiltonian defining me a K0 class, I can pair it with this trace to get a number. So suppose I have a Hamiltonian which has a gap at E, an energy which is not necessarily zero. Let me shift the energy so that now H minus E is gapped at zero, so defines a K0 element. Pair it with the trace per unit volume. Do a little calculation you find the trace per unit volume of the Fermi projection, which is nothing else. Well, I won't be very precise about it, but it's important to note that this is nothing else than the integrated density of states up to energy E in the gap. So it calculates the integrated density of states which are below the gap. So what have we here? On the left side, we have a group and what is important is that because of the choice of alge our algebra, this group here, which is called the gap labeling group, which is obtained from K0 by applying the trace per unit volume, is very small. It's computable in many cases. In many cases, it's finitely generated. It's a subgroup of R. So the gap labeling says that 
If I want, if I calculate the integrated density of states on an energy which is in a gap, then the value must lie in this finitely generated group in many cases. That's the value of the gap labeling. What I will do now, I will actually relate this precise value which I get, of which I know that it is in here, to something else. So how do I relate topological numbers? Well, I relate topological numbers for different systems using extensions of algebras. That's a bit abstract, okay? It just means that I have an algebra together with an algebra morphism onto A, which is subjective. So it has a kernel. The kernel is going to be another algebra E. And the algebraic topology will relate me the K-theory of A to the K-theory of E, which means that there is a homomorphism of groups called the exponential map from K0 of A into K1 of E. That's a bit abstract, but it is very important and useful. I didn't define what a K1 is, but K1, you can think of it as the same definition as K0, except that you require an additional constraint, namely chiral symmetry, that there is a generator, self-adjoint and equal to its inverse, such that if I conjugate H with the generator, I get minus H. That's called the chiral symmetry. And then you do the same thing as before. And if you diagonalize the generator, then H has this off-diagonal form, and to the upper right end, I find something which is homotopic to a unitary. So K1 of E is essentially homotopy classes of unitaries. I'm a bit short here but I don't have the time to make that precise. So how does this homomorphism which relates the elements of K0 of A with the elements of K1 of E look like? Well, as I told you, K0 of A is made by homotopy classes of gapped Hamiltonians. Let's call that gap delta. These live here, these Hamiltonians. I am looking for a pre-image H hat. I can always arrange this pre-image to be self-adjoint, but I will not, in general, be able to arrange this image, pre-image in such a way that it is also gapped. In fact, it's the contrary. I'm interested in the cases where I cannot find a gapped pre-image. So let's call that a pre-image H hat. And the exponential map produces me the class of a unitary. And this unitary is actually the time translation, the time evolution under the pre-image Hamiltonian restricted to the states which are of energy in the gap of the gap Hamiltonian. So, okay. again, the fact that I cannot find a pre-image which is gapped means that this operator H hat will have states, will have spectrum in the gap. And these states are exactly the one on which U acts non-trivially. So this allows me to link topological numbers, well, rather easily, I mean conceptually, I have this map between these K groups. I can apply Chernko cycles, sorry. I can apply Chernko cycles, and so these Chernko cycles give me topological numbers, and so I get a relation between topological numbers. What's important in this picture is to realize Whereas this thing is sort of a universal gadget, I can specialize to different topological numbers by taking different co-cycles. <laughs>
So what happens now for quasicrystals? What will be the extension? So I'm going to define this algebra. What will be the extension for quasicrystals? I defined this algebra before, pattern equivariant operators. Now I want this algebra. And it's very simple. You introduce a boundary by setting a component, let's say the last component, equal to S. And then you say everything to the left is going to be vacuum. So it means that I have my Hamiltonian restricted to the right with certain boundary conditions. The boundary condition will be just actually Dirichlet boundary conditions. That's this one here. So I have the same Hamiltonian as before, except I restrict the D's component to be larger than S. This gives me an extension. Well, strictly speaking, only if the material is repetitive. Otherwise, I have to take a direct sum over the position of the boundary. And se sending this boundary to minus infinity recovers the operator I started with. And so that's my surjection. And now what is in the kernel? Well, these will be operators which are localized at the edge. So now I want to come to the application, which is the example where I link two topological uh, numbers from quasi-crystals, one being a gap label, with another which is related to phase on motion. And this is a very simple example. So it's sort of the simplest uh, current project set which you have ever seen, and you probably all have seen it. I take a co-dimension, one dimension, one current project set with canonical window. And then I will consider the resulting chain to define uh, an insulator in the bulk, so on all of Z. That will be the left side. Uh, I will use gap labeling to get topological numbers which are gap labels. And now, on the right side, I want to know what do I get on the right side? Well, on the right side, I use a parameter to make the phason flips, which I will a little bit explain, continuous in a way which actually can remind you of an old work of Krauss and Silverberg, and use this to define a churn one co-cycle, which then gives me here the work of the phase on motion on the edge states in the gap. So that's the plan. Now this plan actually was motivated, or actually this work was motivated by experiments which have been made by Babu et al. a little while ago. And uh, this interpretation, uh, this is uh, joint work with Emil Prodan. So what are the details? The details are as follows. So here you have your, your uh, one-dimensional, one-co-dimensional current project scheme. Uh, so as you all know, surely you take a Z squared, you place a strip in Z squared in such a way that it is irrationally oriented. There is this slope theta, which is supposed to be irrational. And then all points of the Z squared, which are covered by this strip, and this is a strip which has the canonical width, then all these points can be projected down to give me a sequence of intervals longer and shorter. And that's going to be my material, describing my material. Now, as you also know, perhaps, if you shift the strip into a given direction which is transversal to the direction of the strip, then what happens is that if the boundary of the strip crosses the point of the lattice, then this point enters, and at the same time, another point leaves, and this is a flip 
between these two points, it's a phason flip. And you also know that if you shift the strip in such a way that, you, that, the, sh that the shift is a lattice vector, then you just reproduce the structure. So you could say that the local isomorphism class as being the, the set of sequences which are locally indistinguishable from the one I started out with, that this local isomorphism class is parametrized by a circle. However, it is not. For reasons which I will explain, uh, if your boundary sits exactly on one lattice point, then I actually have a choice. And this choice has to be taken seriously. And the values of alpha where I have this choice, I will call singular. So what's the model? The model is the Komoto model. So it's the standard kinetic part. right? So I associate to each interval uh, an atom, if you wish. And then I look at wave functions in L2 of z. It's a very, very simple model. The internal space is just a C, so they're not even spin. And I give it a potential which just reads off whether I'm sitting on a long or a short interval. Put one if it's long and zero if it's short. This is certainly a pattern equivariant operator. And actually, in some sense, if you want to know what's a pattern equivariant operator, it's exactly these things. Now look at the gap in the spectrum of this operator. Let's put an energy E in that gap. Then, as I told you, uh, shifting the gap to zero defines a K0 class. I also told you that I can look at the extension where I look at a pre-image of H alpha to half space, because if I now introduce a boundary, the boundary is just a point. It's zero dimensional. So I restrict my operator to half space using the boundary condition that at minus one, I'm zero. I apply the exponential map, which produces this unitary. Now this allows me naively, and really naively, by just ignoring that I have this little problem with cutting up, this allows naively to think of a winding number. Why? Well, if I look at this unitary, the unitary doesn't do anything interesting to the states which are outside the gap. So P delta of H hat will be the spectral projection onto the states of H hat in the gap of H. I told you H hat will not be gapped usually. And if it's not gapped, it has an eigenstate in that gap. So outside of the gap, everything is put to one. So one is an infinitely degenerate eigenvalue of this unitary. However, the states in the gap produce other eigenvalues. And here, by these functions, they all lie on a circle. And so I can look at what happens under variation of alpha to this eigenvalue, which is also in S1. So this defines a function from S1 to S1, almost. And I can look at this winding number. Now I have to face the problem that I have actually singular values of alpha. How do I face this problem? Well, the first thing is that the fact that I have these values of alpha where I have a choice of point leads to counterizing the uh, local isomorphism class. So the, the true local isomorphism class is not a circle, but it's a counter set. It's obtained by cutting up the circle at the values which are singular. So suppose I take a value here, which is singular. Then actually, this should mean that I have a choice of two points. So I cut the circle here and add these two points, which correspond to the choice 
to the remaining parts. So I've cut the circle into an interval. I should do the cut for all singular values of alpha, and since the singular values of alpha lie dense, I get a Cantor set. Well, that's actually a bit bad news, because it means that my K1 group is going to be zero, trivial. So how, how can that be saved? Well, it can be saved by making the flips continuous. So in the real quasi-crystal model, the flips are flips. They hop. Now I make them continuous. I make them continuous by just introducing a little interval for each flip. Call that the augmented local isomorphism class. So this looks like well, this here, I can't really draw it because you would have a dense set of infinitely many bubbles which correspond to the added intervals. What's important is that's a circle, so the topology of the circle. And so it allows me to do exactly what I did naively before, to define a winding number for the edge states. And if you do the calculation, you get the following. The K0 group of my model is Z squared with two components M and N. The trace per unit volume maps M to theta times M, where theta is the slope of the strip, and the N to N. On the right-hand side, the K1 group is the K1 group of a circle, it's, it's Z. I calculate its winding number, maps m to m. And so I have this relation that the winding number maps to theta times m. This actually completely determines the left side, because the left side is the integrated density of states of a type binding model, and this has to lie in the interval 0, 1. So once I know what the m is, there's only one possible little n which brings me into this interval. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the values of the integrated density of states and these winding numbers. Let me give you a physical interpretation of this winding number. So here again is the setup which I explained. Uh, the left side, as I told you, is I take the Hamiltonian uh, paired with the trace per unit volume, so I get the integrated density of states of the states below the gap, and uh, this belongs to my gap labeling group, which here was just generated by two elements. On the right hand side, I have this crazy S1, which when I let vary the augmentated parameter around this crazy S1 uh, gives me another value of S1. This you can interpret as a spectral flow. So instead of looking at the unitary now, I'm looking at the spectrum of my operator restricted to half space. And then I see that there are eigenvalues crossing the gap if I vary alpha hat which means that I have a spectral flow from below the gap to above the gap. And this is the interpretation of the winding number. The winding number is this spectral flow along alpha tilde. Now, if you look more closely to it, then you could say, why did you do all this fuzzing around going from an S1 to a Cantor set, going back to an S1? Well, the reason is actually that if you restrict to regular values of alpha, then the contribution to the spectral flow would be zero. The spectrum union of all regular values alpha of H hat alpha has Lebesgue measure zero. So all the spectral flow comes from the added intervals, so it comes from the continuous phase on motion. And this means that I can express this spectral flow in the following form. It's 
one over the width of the gap, sum over all singular points, which are the points where I, made, where I have these flips, and then the integral of the derivative of the eigenvalue along this added interval. But the derivative of an eigenvalue is, is a force, right? It's an energy. I derive the energy with respect to a space variable. So this is a force. So this integral is the work. So this integral is the work performed by the continuous phase on flip on the edge states which are in the gap. That's the interpretation. So the gap label is equal to one over the width of the gap times the work, the phase and flips do on the edge states. How much time do I have? A few minutes. OK, so that was the first application. Let me go to another application where you relate topological break peaks to churn numbers. I haven't very well prepared this application because for this I actually need the continuous version of the pattern equivariant algebra. And the knowledge that the pattern equivariant algebra has a very special form of a crossed product. I'm not going to explain this. But the important message is that the one of the most famous theories in K-theory, most famous theorems in K-theory, is Kohn's isomorphism, which tells me that the K-theory of my algebra of pattern equivariant operators is isomorphic to the K-theory of pattern equivariant functions with a degree shift. And this relates topological Bragg peaks to churn numbers of pattern equivariant operators. So here I have Again, as before, two different algebras of two different physical systems. Their K-theory is isomorphic. This gives us an identity between topological numbers. This uh, is something which also has been looked at by Ackermann and co-authors recently. And uh, I worked this out uh, last year, I suppose. So just what is a topological break peak? Let, let's look at it again as an example because uh, that's, that's, that's telling us everything. Suppose I have a plane wave. It's a plane wave, so there is a wave vector k. And now suppose you take this picture and now you, you sort of look at it from very, very, very high so that you cannot really resolve what you see exactly. Then these lines here, they would look like just parallel lines with a certain distance which determines my wave vector. That's a proof that this plane wave is pattern equivariant. So this plane wave is a function, pattern equivariant function, and moreover it's a phase, so it's a unitary. And since it's a unitary, it defines a class in the K1 group of this algebra. Now, something which I should explain, but I don't have time, is that these wave vectors which appear here, they are exactly the wave vectors appearing in diffraction, which have, in the dynamical systems approach, continuous eigenfunctions. Or to connect to the talk before, if I have a, a vile, almost periodic material, then its back Bragg spectrum would only have topological Bragg peaks. Now, just a very simple observation is that I can produce from this K class the wave vector by a one cocycle. I just have to take the derivative with respect to X. So now, here's the relation in its simplest form in dimension one. The Kuhn isomorphism relates K1 of my pattern equivariant plane waves with K0 of my pattern equivariant operators in such a way that if I take this one cycle 
which produces the wave vector, on the right-hand side, this corresponds to taking the gap labeling. So I get an identity between wave vectors and gap labels. Wave vectors, topological break peaks, or positions of topological break peaks, determine gap labels. That's the statement. Now this statement is topological and therefore a little bit difficult to, let's say, compute. If you say, well, let's take a class of a plane wave, what is actually this insulator it corresponds to? It's not easy to compute at all because the theory is functorial in some sense, so this map here is just determined from the knowledge what it does on one example. Now let's do it on one example and then you find actually that if I have a plane wave with wave vector k and I apply to this k1 class the con isomorphism, then I get an insulator which is the Mathieu Hamiltonian, it's this Hamiltonian, where I'm looking at its first gap. Well, one more slide. This generalizes to higher dimensions, but in such a way that instead of now taking a plane wave, a single plane wave, I'm taking an exterior product of n plane waves. Then the con isomorphism gives me an insulator I don't know how it looks actually, I never calculated explicitly, sitting in this K group of my pattern equivariant operators. I can apply to these plane waves the determinant to obtain an element in the exterior algebra of my group of Bragg peaks. And this corresponds under Hodge duality to applying a child character on the right side. I'm aware that this was a bit short, but I stop here. Any questions from the audience? Yes, up there, let me just pass this microphone. Just a very short one. Does this also work for interacting systems? Uh, the theory using K-theory is designed for one particle approximation, so no interaction. Okay, thank you. S but there are attempts to go beyond not using K-theory. They are not yet there where they can really properly define the bulk boundary correspondence. This will come, I hope. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mihai. Maybe you don't. Maybe for the recording. When you talk about the flips, if I understood it correctly, you can only admit the flips that mean that you remain in the same LI class. Exactly. But uh, so to say, in terms of the general phase on flip dynamics that one looks at, they would be a null set, right? So, uh, um, can you comment on that? No. no. <laughs> I mean, no, if you... I, I, I can say that I have to stay in this local isomorphism class yeah. for this theory because it's actually determined by the algebra. So the yeah, local yeah. isomorphism class is the Gelfand spectrum of the algebra of pattern equivariant functions. And if I would go out of this, I would need another algebra. Maybe you could do still things, but I didn't. So what I meant is, uh, if, you, if you go somewhere where you see LS and you replace it by SL, yeah, with probability one, you will have left the LI class of uh, the Fibonacci chain. 
This is once we've already introduced the boundary, so we're looking only at finite, uh, finite pieces of the infinite system. So you might move into a different region of the same Li space. No. We can talk about that later. Yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll conclude with, uh, is there any other question? Oh, sorry. Is there a question for you, actually? Uh, can we have any chance of having all these works on the tutorial to be available to the to, to the public? So we, we are recording the tutorial, so we will have a video of this, and if, with the permission of the speakers, we can uh, send the, yeah. But even more than that, I have an even better thing, because they're all going to write very pedagogical <laughs> uh, papers for the special issue that we're going to publish. And we're all going to study them, and then there's an exam in the next uh, <laughs> conference. Um, I wanted to ask a practical question, which was related to uh, the fact that you uh, and, and citing Belisar, uh, saying that you can replace the Brillouin zone with something else. Um, and we, we calculate a lot of things by integrating over the Brillouin zone um, as physicists. So what is it that we really need to know in, in order to be able to do the same calculations for the quasi-crystal? The same cal uh, calculation as, so any, as you for know, crystals? In, in a, in a lot, of, in a lot yeah. of, uh, uh, um, physical you know, uh, uh, problems that we look at in a periodic crystal, we end up having to integrate something over the Brillouin zone, and then we have the answer that we're looking for. In the quasi-crystal, we don't have a Brillouin zone that we can integrate over, but you've, you, have, you seem to have the replacement for that, or, well, or am I being too optimistic? Uh, well, I, I was too optimistic at the beginning about this tool. I think, uh, well, the tools which you have here would be trace per unit volume, and commutators with position operators, and so on. And then you can, uh, well, for instance, Emil Prodan is doing this a lot, putting this in a finite system, and giving estimates which guarantee you that the result is sufficiently precise to be the exact answer. But, I mean, if you ask about something else than topology, like uh, calculating exactly the spectrum or something, uh, no. We don't have that. Well, I guess with this semi-optimistic note, uh, we can conclude <laughs> uh, this tutorial session. And um, in about 15 minutes, we'll have some uh, uh, food outside waiting for us. So I'll see you there.